Welcome back. This is Eli Machen. Now I'd like to talk to you about some some new input that I've got that'll help around recovery for those of the addicts and the spouses. In the next three series of videos, uh, I'm going to cover shame protectors and, um, and, and how we guard against, I mean, bottom line, this whole thing is about intimacy anyway, and trying to get to intimacy. And a lot of times when we try to protect shame, we avoid intimacy. So, you know, I, this work has been influenced by Dr. Brene Brown and her research and the things that she's been doing. And uh, so I'm borrowing heavily from her work and trying to cross it over into some of the work that we've been doing at Show Up 365. So, you know, the full credit goes to her. Uh, she's been a big influence on, on my work and my life in the last, oh, I'd say the last year. So I just I throw that out for you is that you let you know. And I, I highly recommend, by the way, that you go to our website and it's right here. And bottom line, you can order any of her video ta audio tapes, which I think are, are, are incredible, any of them. Uh, the one that I've really enjoyed a lot is uh, The Power of Vulnerability. And so I, I just I throw that out to you. I highly recommend it. I recommend the videos, I mean the CDs anyway. They're excellent, excellent work. Now, as we talk about shame protectors, she gives out three major big ones, big shields. And so uh, what we'll talk about them is one is foreboding joy. Now, foreboding comes from an old term used to describe the, a portend, a, an omen of bad or ill that's coming. So there's, there's this omen of, you know, of, of ill will towards joy or foreboding joy, as she calls it, in the sense that we seek to avoid joy because we wait for the other shoe to drop. Now, I'm going to cover that a little bit later, but that's the one major shield. And I see this really, really a whole lot of where individuals, addicts, are not wanting to, they say as they approach recovery, they say, I'm probably going to relapse. Or, you know, they get in recovery, I don't see how I could stay sober. Uh, this is actually foreboding joy. Now, the spouse does this by the sense of when they get into, uh, they don't want to trust you, the addict, they don't want to trust life in, in, at large because they have constantly been betrayed, they have constantly been deceived and let down, and they keep waiting for this other shoe to drop. We'll discuss that in this whole lecture here as we go through it, but this is the first one that she talks about. The second one is perfectionism. Now, uh, as we go through this and talk about this, you know, bottom line is that life, the world, my universe has got to be perfect. I've got to do it perfect in order for me to ever be happy or to be, have joy. And so perfectionism and the constant pursuit of perfectionism or the expectation of perfectionism in others is that protection. We're guarding against joy. We're guarding against leaning into vulnerability. We're guarding against being vulnerable that we might be hurt. So we use this great big shield to protect us. And the last one is numbing. And that could be any of the acting out behaviors that's done, whether it's with substance or behavior, we numb. <clears throat> and we do that a lot in this country. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about today is foreboding joy. We'll get to the others in the subsequent weeks that follow. And I think this is really key here as we look at foreboding joy is that we understand that this is a mechanism that we put in place. And I'm going to break it down so we can see all the different ways of how I think that in, uh, in my experience and what I've seen is how people forebode joy. Now, foreboding joy is constantly rehearsing my mind what could happen or what should have happened. I mean, we stay in the future, we stay in the past about what might be, where, you know, this, this, this whole concept of being addicted to the possibilities. And so we run through, now this can be even in fantasy. I think that there, fantasy is a huge component to keep us away from experiencing true joy in our lives is because we just as soon do it in a fantasy world rather than the world, real world. Now, this also happens with spouses and constantly rehearsing their mind what could happen tomorrow if something doesn't change, or what should have happened, and what they could have done or should have done in the past to make it different today. Then it's reliving over and over the pain that I've experienced yesterday, today, so I won't be surprised tomorrow. In other words, bottom line is that we play out in our mind different ways of bad things happening so that we won't wake up one day and find out the end of the world happened and we weren't ready for it. It somehow now that surprised us. So we're working off of a, a a false belief that somehow or another, if I can think of all the different ways things can go bad, then if, when it does, I won't be shocked. Now, that's foreboding joy. Now, 
It's that constant looking at doom and gloom. <clears throat> Even if we're experiencing something fun, we seek to avoid that. We don't want to be happy or joyous or, or have fun a lot of ways because of the fact that, well, if I do, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip and something bad is going to happen. And so we're constantly shoving this huge thing up the hill of doom and gloom. And it's like, you know, it becomes that people say, well, it was a really good day, but, you know, I don't want to say it was a good day. You know, it was okay. You know, I'm going to take the middle of the road here so that I don't get too far in any one extreme. So I don't, I don't want to be too happy. I don't, want to be, I don't want to say that things are too great because bad stuff could happen. Then there's the other way is that we can constantly, you know, we work under the, the, the thought that knowledge will protect me from the possibility of what might happen. So I constantly are reading books. I'm reading self-help books. I'm reading everything I can about whatever particular addiction or whatever is going on, so that, or self-help book, so that, that, that I am prepared for that big, bad thing that's going to happen tomorrow. And so if I have enough information, then I'll be par- prepared and I won't be surprised. Bottom line, this is foreboding joy. Now, I'm not telling you to be ignorant. I'm not telling you not to educate yourself, but an obsessive amount of this and I've seen this over and over and over, clients, is that, that bottom line is that they constantly are buying and, 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 and digging into books as if these books are going to protect them from that shoe that's going to drop or the sky that's going to fall in. The other thing that I've seen happen over and over is to forebode joy is to stay in a constant state of anger. You're just angry at life. You're angry at your spouse. You're angry at the attic in your life. You're angry, just angry. And it's like... If I stay angry, then I'm going to be big enough, strong enough, that I'm going to be able to deal with whatever comes tomorrow because I felt really small and diminished when it happened yesterday or the day before. Now, I'm using those timelines as just in the past or in the future. Now, But what anger does is it isolates me from anybody getting too close, and that way I'm not going to be hurt. And I'm just going to be real angry about what you did 20 years ago, and I'm not going to forgive you or let it go. And if I stay in this anger state, then I will be safe. And that's a fallacy. Basically, all it does is isolate me, and I never really experience joy or intimacy. Now, the other thing is that if I constantly, obsessively investigate, that's another form of foreboding joy. In other words, I know it's going to happen, and if I just keep looking, I'm going to find it. And I'm going to know that it's going to happen, that you're going to go back to drink, you're going to go back to drugs, you're going to go back to sex. You're going to go do those things again, and once again, I'm going to be let down. So doggone it, you're not going to surprise me this time because I'm going to be on the lookout. And I'm going to watch day and night, 24-7. I'm going to be on top of it because you're not going to pull that off on me again. Well, what happens is, is that we're foreboding joy. We cannot experience the joy of today because we're obsessively looking for when the sky is going to fall. Now, the other one would be is that the obsessively rethinking what you should have done or could have done to where, why you're not here today. That obsessive thinking, that obsessive thought is an attempt to protect yourself from the inevitable happening down the road and you getting blindsided. So this is a preparation. If I obsessively think it over and over and over and over again, then I will not be surprised again. Well, that's foreboding joy. If you do this, you're never going to experience joy regardless of what the addict or the spouse does in your life. You're going to run around the rest of your life like Chicken Little, looking up at the sky, waiting for something to fall out of it. And eventually something may. But all those days that you were looking up, you never saw what else was going on in the barnyard around you. You missed out on life because you live life as Chicken Little did, running around thinking the sky's going to fall. Well, Things do happen. There's no stopping it. There's no guarantees. But Chicken Little here wants a guarantee, wants to know when it's going to happen and never experience a day of joy, a day of peace, a day of surrender because they're always looking up to see when the sky's going to fall. Now, foreboding joy is trust abhorrent behavior. In other words, if I convince that the sky's going to fall and i got to look up and see that, that I never have to trust I don't trust me. I don't trust the addict or the co-addict in my life. I won't trust anybody because if you trust somebody, you know, I'm going to be hurt. And I'll be doggone if I won't trust anybody again. Well, that's foreboding joy. 
then I'm going to live through life never trusting anybody, which is not really true. You do at some points. Every time I get on the freeway, I'm trusting a lot of other people on the freeway. They're going to stay in their little dotted lines. They don't run over into mine. Now, we're also, there's this whole piece about trusting in, in this whole equating trust with naivety. Well, I trusted before, and look where it got me. Well, no, I'm not real sure that was trust. At least in my life, it was naivety. Bottom line, I went with the philosophy, I'll trust you until you hurt me. Well, that's not real wise, and that's not really trust. That's naivety. You know, the Scripture says that the prudent or the wise sees evil and hides himself but the naive proceed and pay the penalty. You know, I wasn't wise. And so I didn't require others to earn trust in my life. You know, this doesn't mean that I don't allow others to earn the trust. But I don't also have to go at it with naivety. And then also equating trust with denial. In other words, there have been times in my life I know that I closed my eyes to certain things. I did not follow through with boundaries and consequences. And, and I'm saying that, no, I'm in trusting. Well, that's a missed understanding. You know, if I'm trusting, it doesn't mean I live in denial. You know, I go into things with my eyes wide open. But bottom line is that if I've allowed somebody to earn the trust, it doesn't mean they're infallible or they're going to be perfect. They may mess up. And you know something? I'm going to survive. I'm going to survive. And it doesn't stop me from enjoying joy today. Now, look at the difference in some of those things. If I, if I am foreboding joy, then I'm going to mistrust. I'm not, I'm not going to trust anybody, including myself. I'm going to live a very lonely life, and I'm going to stay real disconnected with anybody in my life. I'm not going to trust support groups. I'm not going to trust my therapist. I'm not going to trust, you know, the, that can go way on out to where I don't even trust the preacher or or, or what I read in the Scripture, or God. And so i got to be real controlling and stay on top of things so that life will be, at least it won't, bad stuff won't happen too bad. Versus if I'm willing to lean into joy, then I learn to trust self. I, I learn to create a safe support system around me, and I seek connection with others that I see as safe, that have earned that trust. And then I can live surrendered. I'm going to let go of my tomorrows. I can, I've got a higher power in my life. I can let tomorrow go, and I'll leave it, and I'm just going to enjoy today. You know, my higher power will be there with me tomorrow. I'll, whatever happens, we'll deal with it then. Today, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to go fly fish. I am going to go uh, take in a movie, go on a date with my wife, or I'm going to do so. I am going to enjoy today, and I'll let go, and I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. <laughs> This doesn't mean that we can go through life saying that, you know, we don't want to talk about the elephant. I'm not talking about saying that if I'm going to experience joy, I can't talk about the elephant in the room. No. But it also, that elephant doesn't have to rule my life. I don't ignore it, but it doesn't run my life. I'm not going to stick my head in the hole, in the sand, and act as if nothing happens. I won't do that. Foreboding joy doesn't mean I do this. And the opposite. I think that one of the things that Brene talks about is, is, is that when she says when we lose our tolerance for vulnerability, we forebode joy. Now, if you take that over into the vernacular of the show up place that I've talked about, is bottom line that if I'm unwilling to come here, then this is leaning into joy, showing up at the show up place. It means I have boundaries in place. There are things that I have that so forth, and I invite others to do that, and I know that I have no control over what goes on on this other side. But it also means that I am willing to take the risk and stand at the show-up place and lean into joy and be vulnerable with no guarantees. There are no guarantees when I come here that somebody's going to either show up or stay there. There's, there's just, that doesn't exist in life. But if I wait for the guarantees before I get here, I'll never come. You, you get what I'm saying here. So bottom line is, this is what I'm referring to when we talk about foreboding joy and being vulnerable. It, the short place is a vulnerable place. And so I've got to be willing to come here without the guarantees, without certainties of tomorrow, and learn to embrace joy, at least from my perspective. Now, that means that I need to learn to lean into joy. Part of that means is that I don't have to be certain or guaranteed 
of outcomes of tomorrows to have a fun time today. Now, that's what's within reason, but I'm just saying, that can I experience the joy in the moment? Can I experience the happiness that we're having and not think, well, sad and bad things are going to happen tomorrow. I better not go there today because the letdown will be too much. No. If I can be comfortable with understanding, leaning into what I have no certainty of tomorrow, and I'm okay with that because I'll be okay. I'm okay. I can handle whatever happens tomorrow. Then I've learned that I can lean into the joy. Now, lean into joy means what? It means accepting life as it comes with no guarantees. It means a willingness to live in a safe community, interacting and being with others that are safe people. It means that I can ask for help when, I'm, when I need it. it all, and being willing to have the, somebody say no. <laughs> it also means staying daily connected to safe people, regularly practicing that, practicing daily gratitude. Now, what I mean by that is it's saying over and over different things that I am very grateful for. I think there's a huge piece to this gratitude that Brene talks about that also fights against shame. What shame is our enemy. Remember that. And if I am grateful for what I have, I am grateful for who I'm in a relationship with. I am grateful for me and in the, in the minute things of life every day that I begin, the contentment level in my life goes way up. I can also, in this point, that if I lean into joy, then I am willing to allow others to earn the trust back in a relationship with me. And then I can play often. It's okay to play. Brene talks about in her research that wholehearted people learn to play, then they play often. Do you play? Now, two factors to joy, gratitude and empathy. One is being grateful for where you are, being grateful for your support group, being grateful for your counselor, being grateful for your spouse, being grateful for everything. The other side is learning empathy. Now, it has to begin here. So we're learning empathy for yourself. And however you and your therapist work on that, I think it's important for you to begin to deal with, you know, that wounded boy or that wounded girl in your life way back there in your past and deal with the wounds, deal with the abuse that you've experienced so that, and your trauma and whatever else is back there so that you can begin to feel empathy for that little child within and self. Out of doing that, you can then connect with other people's pain and begin to feel empathy for others. And these two keys are the key to moving into joy, but it also eradicates shame. If you can live here, you eradicate shame. And shame, again, let me just state, shame is the enemy, not the addiction. Shame. We get into addictions because of the shame. So these two are the two guides. I encourage you to do a gratitude journal. I encourage you to start that today or even put it into your journal that you may have uh, on Show Up 365. You know, put it in there. Things every day that you're grateful for. Now, sharing items that you're grateful for daily or at meals. You know, sit down and make it a practice that you do daily with your spouse and with your family members and say, what is something you're grateful for today? Now, great, gratitude is not denial. It's, it's recognizing things that are so that there's times when we complain, it doesn't mean that we're not grateful. Oh, this hip is really bothering me, and I'm limping. It's just, oh, gone it. But then I'm also grateful that I, I experienced a pretty healthy life. So can I have that balance? Yes, you can. Complaining doesn't mean that you're not grateful. It means it's in perspective. Now, I want, you to, I want to challenge you to share your pain with others who have experienced what you've experienced. And then two, connecting with your pain with other people's pain. Understand where they hurt from where you are. That's practicing empathy. That's knowing what to do with it. Now, that's the first video. That's around the foreboding joy. I'm going to cover uh, the other two, numbing and uh, perfectionism. And so, bottom line, come in next week and get the other two. Take care.